Hi friends, welcome to this Facebook Live session. I'm Himanshu Sharma, welcoming you all to today's session. Today, Irene is not going to join us due to some personal issues, so we are partnering her. Uh, I have today with us again, Dr. Om Lakhani, our endocrinologist and diabetes specialist, who's working with Zydus Hospital Ahmedabad. I welcome you, Dr. Om Lakhani, to, to today's session. Thank so you, it's just the two of us who are going to run through today's interesting session. Uh, okay, friends, let me just brief you a little before we go ahead with Dr. With, before we bombard Dr. Om with a lot of questions today that we have. Uh, so today is basically dedicated to understanding diabetes. Uh, this is one such disease that not just affects the patients, but it also affects the whole family because it is a lifestyle disease. So there are changes that we expect. There are changes to the food habits. There are changes to the lifestyle that come into picture. A lot of aspects of life with diabetes that may affect the quality of your life that can include is continuous demand for diabetes care, such as eating carefully, exercising, monitoring regular blood glu uh, glucose levels, scheduling and planning of medication that plays a very important role when it comes to diabetic treatment. It is not like you can pop a pill anytime you wish to. And very important, is managing symptoms of low or very high blood glucose because sometimes it can be life-threatening as well. Uh, so patients with diabetes can exhibit symptoms like excessive thirst, need to go to the washroom, pee a lot, and perpetual tiredness. You will not feel fresh, you will not feel healthy, even if you technically are fine. Still, because of the diabetes, you may have a lot of issues. So it can also increase your risk of getting other serious problems with your eyes, kidneys, heart, brain, a lot of other factors. So it's a lifelong condition that affects your everyday life. Whoever is a diabetic would know it the best, how bad it is to be a diabetic. So you may need to change your diet, take medication, and have regular checkups with your specialists. So these are certain things that we are going to discuss with Dr. Oum today, and we are specifically going to act, uh, going to, you know, emphasize on type 2 diabetes and try to look at, Dr. Oum is going to help us understand if there is a way that diabetes can be reversed. So Dr. Oum, uh, without wasting much time, I would just like to start right off. And our first question, which I would like uh, you to answer for our viewers and myself, is that can you just briefly explain in a layman's perspective, what exactly is diabetes, how it is caused? Okay. So, uh, you know, a lot of you might already be knowing that there are two major forms of diabetes. So one is the type one diabetes, the other is type two diabetes. Uh, type one diabetes used to be called as insulin dependent diabetes in the past, but the terminology has now evolved to call it type one. Uh, type 1 is relatively rare. It's a rarer form of diabetes. Uh, it generally tends to occur more in children. Uh, of course, it can occur at any age, but it is generally more common between the ages of 5 to 15 years of age. That is the condition where the pancreas, which is an organ in our body, which produces a very important hormone, which is known as insulin. This insulin is not produced at all by the body. And because of this complete insulin deficiency, you have to give insulin from outside, and that is type 1 diabetes. That's a separate form of diabetes. I think, you know, perhaps in a future discussion, we can discuss more on type one. But today we are going to focus on the more common form of diabetes, which is known as a type two diabetes. So basically type two diabetes is like, uh, it's like, you know, those uh, seesaws that you see, right? So, you know, if you go, one thing goes down, the other thing goes up and vice versa, right? So there is a, in our body, there is a balance which is made between something known as insulin resistance and the other is body's ability to produce insulin. Okay. Now, if let's say you have excess weight, if you're obese, you know, you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, you have your metabolic syndrome is, uh, you know, you have metabolic syndrome, you have excess of, uh, you know, fat in your body. In that situation, the insulin resistance keeps increasing. Okay. So you have a higher insulin resistance. Now your insulin production, tries to match up with your insulin resistance. At some point of time, the body's pancreas just gives up. It cannot produce anymore. 
so what happens the insulin resistance keeps going up but the insulin cannot match up with the insulin resistance and this is when there is a gap between the requirement of insulin and the production of insulin and because of this gap there is you have the sugars which go high which is what happens in type 2 diabetes then eventually what happens is because if the weight keeps gaining you know you keep having increased insulin resistance but the body's production of insulin because you know you have the pancreas which is under stress the insulin production keeps going down as date as you know uh, type 2 diabetes evolves eventually it comes a point where the gap between the resistance and the production is very high so in that case again you have the insulin which is not enough for the body and hence the sugars remain high something like in economics you know you have supply and demand kind of situation right so when the supply is low and the demand is high the price of the product becomes more precious in the same way when the requirement is high when you have higher insulin resistance but there is not enough insulin being produced at that point of time just like the prices increase in this case the sugars increase and the sugar increase is known as type 2 diabetes okay thanks so that was informative it was very simple and informative i'm sure all of us would remember what's the basic difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes thank you dr om uh, now coming to the next question now usually what happens is uh, that people are given medication right when they start with when they have symptoms of diabetes or when that they are detected with diabetes uh, and it's told that once you start your medication for diabetes it is not going to be a cure it is just going to be management of diabetes so i would just like to understand that is it possible there are two parts to the question first of all is it really possible that there is a cure to type 2 diabetes secondly patients who move away from injectable insulin to oral pills over a period of time can they sustain it so these are the two questions that i would like you to please answer for us so i think uh, you know the appropriate scientific term to use for this situation is known as remission okay so you know we know that nothing in life is permanent right nothing good is permanent you know we know we are living in a in a very stable society right now but you know you could have chaos lurking any moment right so you know when i say that uh, a patient goes off diabetes medications off insulin he is not on any glucose lowering medications or glucose lowering therapy and yet he or she can maintain good blood sugars that situation is known as remission right and why is it why is it called remission why is it not called cure because like i said nothing in life is permanent right so if that person is able to maintain his lifestyle in exactly the way he's been prescribed and exactly the way he's able to maintain his weight he's able to maintain his uh, healthy eating patterns and exercise he will remain in that situation maybe it you know how long would depend completely on him how long can he maintain that lifestyle how long can he uh, you know maintain discipline as long as he can do that he can remain in a state of remission but once the situation goes back you know you have diwali coming up and you know you you uh, binge on your sweets well you can be back to square one where we started initially right so what i'm trying to say is there are two myths which i want to burst here first of all myth number 1 it was believed in the past it's actually, actually not a myth it was actually scientifically believed that type 2 diabetes is a permanent disease which is completely wrong it is not a permanent disease it can be reversed it can lead you can go from a situation where you were on insulin to a situation where you don't even require a single pill right that is possible okay not only is it possible it has been proven that it is possible it has been proved in clinical trials it has been published in reputed journals and now in fact so much so that uh, himanshu you would be interested to know that in our own prescription we have a prescription format where we actually write that you know when they see the patient for the first time i i write it whether there is a possibility that this patient can develop remission or not right so it it's baked right into the system the second myth is that once you know and then there's there is there are you know a uh, perennial pessimist and then there are perennial optimist right the perennial pessimist would say that no 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 it's not possible but you know reality is it is possible then there will be perennial optimist who would say that look 
I am, you know, I've stopped my medicines, I stopped my insulin, I'm king of the world. And now, you know, I'm invincible, which is not true because then you are in a state of remission, but you're not in a state of permanent cure because a permanent cure is not possible, right? You can remain in that state of remission if you maintain the same level of discipline. If not, you go back to square one, right? So answer to the question, as a simple answer to the question is yes, it is possible to reverse diabetes. It is possible for the patient to go into diabetes remission. But if you maintain everything, you can remain in that situation. If not, you can go back to where you originally started. Uh, that was interesting. I would also like to know a little more thing, as you mentioned about remission, that you actually record it in your first prescription itself and the patient comes to you. So would you like to share anything with our viewers as to how exactly you, you do it or that you would like to do it at a, at a later point in time as we progress? No, I'll, I'll, I want to show you something, right? Yeah, so uh, I'll just sh share my screen and I'll, I'll, I'll you know, uh, try to sort of uh, show some, you know, how we do it. And also I'd like to show you some real life patients, you know, where, uh, you know, some recent ones, in fact, I just, you know, right. uh, patients we've seen in the last few days. Okay. So what happens is when a patient typically comes to me, right? Let's say you have a patient who comes to me with type 2 diabetes colitis. What we do is, you know, typically what most guidelines and most people, you know, what they do, they treat to fail, right? For example, you know, I'll give you one medicine. If it doesn't work, I'll give you another medicine. If it doesn't work, I'll give you an insulin, so on and so forth, right? So that is the typical conventional strategy, which has been applied for a long time. And because it was, that is what was applied for a long time. We were not able to really achieve, you know, the results, which we are now achieving today. It's like this, you know, and those who follow cricket and IPL, I know Himanshu is bored that I give a cricket analogy every time, but you know, if that's you watch fine, IPL, fine. yeah, so this is the IPL season, right? You have the, uh, you know, the, the uh, important matches coming up in a few days. Uh, so, you know, in IPL, if you see, uh, you have 20 overs, so you have a limited time. And what do you do? You send your best batsman first, right? You don't send a, uh, you know, a tail ender, uh, you know, to bat in the first few overs, right? You send, send your best batsman. So you send your uh, Virat Kohli and you send your Padikal and you send your Shekhar Dhawan and uh, Chris Gale and all that on the top, right? So you'll have best... the hard hitters send first. Yeah, correct. So you send the best batsman first, right? Uh, you know, you hit hard first. And then later on, you have the, you know, the other batsmen who come up who may not be as talented as the batsman who first, you know, who preceded them, right? So we don't, you know, uh, play cricket to fail, right? I would not say that I'll send the weakest batsman first. I'll allow him to, you know, play a few overs. I allow him to fail. And then I'll send, you know, uh, Virat Kohli at, at number nine when he can, he will have to kind of salvage his, his uh, you know, his team. This is exactly what is, uh, what has been done so far in diabetes management. You give a weakest medicine first. And then you add another weaker medicine and then another weak one and slightly stronger one. And then you add the strongest possible treatment that is insulin. Right? And that is completely wrong. So what we do is, when I see a patient, I assess the patient first. And what you do is hit hard. Okay, So the, in the first few weeks of treatment, we actually you know, give more medicines. We give more uh, insulin if required. What we do is we cut off something which is known as a glucotoxicity cycle. Right? So we know that sugar, high sugars is toxic to the body. And high sugar perpetuates higher sugar. It creates a vicious cycle. So I need to break this cycle. And by breaking this cycle, I can do it only by hitting it hard. Right? And then once the patient's sugar becomes better, then we start reducing the insulin. Stop the insulin at some point, And then reduce the medicines. Right? So this is how we typically kind of invert the treatment pyramid. And by doing this, you know, we have achieved tremendous success as far as diabetes control is concerned. So I'll show you some real patients, you know, example. And a lot of patients, you know, uh, they're surprised when they hear for the first time that I can actually stop their insulin, right? So this Even is Even I was surprised when I was discussing with you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, look at, look at this. I'll show you some real, uh, you know, recent WhatsApp conversation. You can see the dates here also to follow that, you know, uh, they're not very old. So, you know, look at this patient, right? So this patient is on 14 units of insulin, right? Uh, his fasting sugar is 100. Uh, then we reduced, then he, you know, himself reduced a few units on his own. And then we reduced it further to eight units. 
uh, and then we reduce to four units and then eventually in a few days the insulin was stopped right it just takes a few days okay I'll show you another one you can see here right this patient was told, told to you know he was on insulin quite a you know almost 30 40 units eventually you know things became better we stopped the insulin on you can say uh, on uh, 12 10 uh, 12th of october this is an american time kind of thing so yeah it, it would stop and the next day his sugar is still fasting sugar is within normal range you know another patient right maintaining good sugars stop insulin just inform me the fasting you know uh, thursday so it was just a few days back another patient right so look at look at him 14 units 12 units 8 units 4 units so it's a reverse countdown right go there further 4 units stop insulin wow, right that's so it's possible you know and again you know uh, look like i said we have already baked that system into here you know you can see we have written is it possible for this patient to undergo remission we just at the very beginning we tell the patient look it's possible if you work hard we'll be able to do it right and then you can see this patient right uh, very you know this is very fresh in my mind because this patient consulted online in fact uh, just a, a couple of days back and you know this patient actually came to me with sugars of almost 300 400 when he first came right he was started on insulin in fact you know his initial doses was as high as 30 40 units right since then he's been on a regular follow-up just a few days back we stopped all his medicine so the last medicine he was taking was jardian's met we stopped his medicine and he continues to maintain good sugar and this is his continuous glucose monitoring chart you know we use this device which continuously monitors the sugar for 24 hours you can see this is after stopping his insulin his medicines everything is maintaining a completely flat glucose value you can see here on the bottom you have 70 to 180 that is the typical range we see it's average sugar what you see on the let me point it out so what you see here is his sugar average sugar which is 92 and we know that anything which is uh, you know less than 154 is generally considered to be good this is the range over here 70 to 180 and you can see all his sugars are within this range right none of his sugars in fact they don't even cross 150 right which is almost like a normal person right if you if you know you have a non diabetic person put a continuous glucose monitor you will, this is exactly the kind of picture you will see in this patient right so what i'm trying to show you is two things a once you start insulin it doesn't mean that insulin is permanent right we can stop insulin uh, second right uh, you can even stop the medicines right so it is possible in fact you know those who are interested can uh, there's a recent not recent but maybe two years back there's a clinical trial called as direct trial published in the one of the leading journals of the world which is known as the lancet where they actually showed that in in a big cohort of patients uh, from the uk uh, who were in the, the nhs system they actually could reverse diabetes in about 80 percent of the patients which is quite remarkable and i think you know this after this trial things have changed a lot and the nhs is now insisting that you know uh, a lot of these patients who do need this should enroll in this trial or uh, similar trials and possibly consider remission as a part of strategy as for the whole country uh, of of united kingdom right so that's the interesting part well this was absolutely enlightening uh, because every time that we have been hearing this especially i'm talking about myself and i'm sure most of the layman people like me is that once you contract diabetes once you have it there is no way that you can reverse it but the fact that you have shown live patient cases discussion so that makes a lot of sense that with i mean we have to support the doctor and only then the doctor can support us so it's like the regime the plan that you give as you mentioned that we have to send our best uh, best batsman to bat first and we have to tackle the problem in such a way that it doesn't enhance so much then then you know there's no way uh, there's no looking back so especially my friends from africa because majority of the patients we've been receiving from africa for renal issues are primarily due to diabetes so if you can just say something for them as well because kidney issues primarily their kidney and even when you talk about few neurological disorders they have a very complex association with diabetes if you can quickly uh, you know give a message out to those friends of mine yeah so you're absolutely right there are four organs of the body which are particularly affected by diabetes so one is your uh, eye especially at the retina you know the one which is uh, it's a film which is behind our eye uh, so the retina is one 
and in fact diabetes is one of the leading causes of preventable blindness in the world right so you know if you control your diabetes you can actually prevent blindness in a large majority of people because sometimes that there are small vessels there which can bleed and which can sometimes lead to blindness and loss of vision second organ is your kidney again like you very rightly said worldwide 60% of the patients on dialysis 60% of the patient who undergo transplant they are having diabetes and diabetes is the single most leading cause of kidney failure in the world in india this statistics may even be exaggerated there might be even more numbers in fact we i believe that almost 80% of chronic kidney disease patients in india are having diabetes at some point of time so diabetes is the leading cause of kidney failure in the world again if you look at your nose right so diabetes as we discussed in one of the earlier discussion also that diabetes impacts the nervous system and it can you know one of the leading causes of amputations so you know uh, maybe i'd say 50 years back the leading cause of amputation was war currently the leading cause of amputation is war with another kind which is war with your with your food right which is basically you know uh, type of diabetes so you know a lot of patients uh, have you know if you see patients in your family if you have anybody who is you know they 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 would have lost a small toe they would have lost that their you know big great toe maybe their entire foot you know most likely you know it was diabetes which led to that right so that's the third one and of course the fourth is your heart and your blood vessels and uh, you know we know that again diabetes leads to increased risk of heart attack increased risk of stroke and again it is fast emerging as the leading cause for that diseases as well and you know every single point of time you see a patient with heart attack you know one of the things which your heart doctor will always ask do you have diabetes and more often you will ask get the answer which is yes so for those patients with kidney disease and diabetes uh, well they need to have better sugar control to prevent the kidney disease from worsening in fact it is now possible that kidney disease you know especially in early stages of kidney disease you can actually reverse the kidney problem and i think it would be crime in this current scenario that you know maybe the next generation of doctors maybe 10 years down the line i don't want them to blame me that boss you did not do a good job with blood sugar control and we keep seeing a lot of patients with kidney disease no right i think i i hope that in the in the next 10 years or maybe in the next decade uh, you know we'll see less number of kidney patients because you know we have done a good job in maintaining our you know blood sugar control Uh, that was very very positive uh, of you dr lakani that you are concerned about what our future generation the coming doctors the coming of doctors are going to think about us and yes friends so especially if you have kidney issues pertaining uh, which you which has been extended due to diabetes it's very important for you to be careful because as dr om said that there is a fair amount of possibility if it is managed early you will not need a transplant you will not need to manage your kidneys on medication uh thank you dr om now another question which uh, which i'm sure a lot of people would be eager to uh, eager to listen to is that diabetes is often related to obesity often rather most like the moment you are heavy built like me or maybe more than me it's like you know you must be diabetic or you will be having diabetic so but i have myself seen a lot of people who are lean and thin but yes still they suffer from diabetes so is there any scientific basis of uh, being fat and being diabetic or there are people who are fat but not diabetic if you can just quickly brief us through that yeah so uh, you know in a body you have two types of fat one is subcutaneous fat so that is fat under your skin right which is you know which is visible to everybody and then you have the visceral fat that is the fat which is uh, beneath our skin which surrounds the various organs of our body like the liver the kidney the heart right this is known as visceral adiposity or visceral fat okay now let me give you a very you know example which will very which will make these things very clear uh, in japan have you seen sumo wrestlers right sumo wrestlers nobody you know my my a uh, four year old little girl will say that dad this guy is fat okay so sumo wrestler is fat but do you know that sumo wrestlers are actually more healthy than you and me okay they are healthier they in fact live a right. longer life right the reason is that sumo wrestlers tend to have subcutaneous fat so they're fat under the skin 
is more. They have more subcutaneous fat, but they have very little visceral fat. Okay, so the fat which surrounds the uh, organs of the body. Now, the visceral fat is the bad fat. That's the one which produces diabetes. That's the one which produces heart disease, right? And that's the one which you can't see. That's the that's the hard part of it, right? So, what Indian patients and you know this is this is in fact that lean diabetes is a very Indian concept. You know, uh, I'm not sure whether that's a that actually holds true for Africa, but in India. You'll yeah. see a lot of patients who are lean and yet they suffer from type 2 diabetes. Which in the West, you know, if you talk to Westerners, you talk to an American, they're oh, this, this guy's diabetic. No, I can't believe it. You know, it's like that. So the reason is that Indians genetically, for whatever reasons, we tend to have more of visceral fat and less of subcutaneous fat. So we are exactly opposite to those sumo wrestlers, right? So, you know, we are, we are having more of the bad fat, but that bad fat, you know, the, the other fat, which, which is, you know, which is perhaps not bad, not that bad is not visible, right? So that's, you know, we tend to look lean, but we actually are, you know, we have a kind of, you know, it's like an iceberg, you know, there's, there's a big chunk, which is beneath the skin, which you really can't see. So there is definitely a concept of lean type two diabetes, which is in India. Again, if you've been practicing diabetes in India for a long time, you know, you know, you in fact see these patients every single day, every second patient of mine is a lean patient who, American or a European won't believe that this patient has diabetes, you know, so that's, that's the kind of way, right? So the lesson we learn from this is that, uh, you know, uh, visceral fat, the fat, which is beneath your skin, which lies in, you, you know, surrounds the organs. That's the bad fat. That's the one you can't see. So it is not necessary that every obese person is diabetic. And at the same time, it's not necessary that every lean person is not uh, free from diabetes, you know? Uh, it often depends on the visceral fat content. There are ways in which you can check the visceral fat, but those are more expensive and that's, you know, relatively less common. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's a visceral fat. The fat underneath your body, underneath your skin, underneath your muscles uh, is the one which really is, is uh, you know, leading to diabetes. Well, that was very informative. So, friends, if you are lean and thin and still diabetic, now you know why you are so Dr. Om has been extremely amazing at giving the example of sumo wrestler, which I'm definitely going to read more about on the internet as to what is their diet. Not that it's going to help us, but yes, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, Dr. Om, now last question for the day, uh, which is all to do with what you would be advising your patients the most, that is exercising. Now, does exercise really help in managing type 2 diabetes? How much exercise for an average individual? Let's say there is a person in mid 40s, mid 50s, recently detected diabetic. What is the amount of exercise that they should be doing on a weekly basis to make sure that they are doing it sufficiently? There are times when people may not be exercising regularly. It could be maybe thrice a week or four times a week. So if you can just throw some light on this before we close for the day. Yeah. So uh, see, exercise is very important, not just for uh, diabetes it is it is it is it is helpful in all stages so if you're a pre-diabetic it will help you prevent diabetes if you're already diabetic it will help you manage your diabetes better and if you already are on the spectrum where you already started having complications like heart disease again exercising will reduce the risk of having diabetes related complications so across the spectrum of diabetes patients exercise helps the only thing, you know, what you have to understand is, and this is what people don't understand, uh, you know, often, uh, you know, when, when I was young uh, and when I wanted to lose weight and a lot of young people who want to lose weight, they often hit the gym thinking that exercising hard will help them lose weight, which is absolutely wrong. Exercise does not help you lose weight. Exercise helps you maintain your weight and exercise help has a lot of other benefits on a, which help you maintain your uh, diabetes, your heart disease and etc. much better. If you want to lose weight along with exercise, you'll have to work on your diet as well, right? So a lot of people, you know, they give up exercising because they say, I don't see results. Now I said, what results do you want to see? They said, I'm not losing weight. But boss, exercise is not for losing weight. Exercise has other benefits. Your metabolism improves and, you know, you may or may not lose too much weight, but you will still, your body will benefit immensely. Your body is actually made for exercising, you know, and at the end of the day, we are jungle animals. You know, we are supposed to run around and hunt those uh, you know, uh, chickens which we are eating on a plate every day. So I think, you know, uh, that's that's the problem. 
right? Uh, you know, we stopped running around and we, you know, stopped, you know, sort of ordering stuff on Zomato, you know, which, which is what has entirely changed, you know, our lifestyle. So exercising is very important. Now coming to the next question, how much you should exercise? Well, I think, you know, there is, I, would, I have a slightly different take on this, you know, and if you, uh, you know, uh, I would suggest if you're not, uh, you know, those are listening to this, uh, there's a very nice book called Atomic Habits uh, by uh, a guy called James Clear. I think it's a highly recommended book. You know, if you're suffering from a chronic disease or any kind of problem in your life, that's a book you should read. I think it's really going to change your life. Definitely. So, you know, one concept of Atomic Habits is that don't make, you know, massive changes. So, you know, uh, you have, you know, the, the uh, you know, you have the uh, Gujarati New Year coming up soon. And, you know, a lot of Gujaratis will, will uh, you know, pledge on the new year that I'm going to leave Fafra and Jalebi and I'm going to exercise and go to the gym, which is, mind you, being a Gujarati myself, I tell you, it's not going to happen, right? So you make big plans on your new years and then you go to the gym, you pay your gym membership and after a week, you're back home, you know, watching your uh, IPL or whatever you're doing, right? Uh, so uh, what James Clear says in his book is that you do exactly the opposite. Don't make big plans make small changes to your life. Okay. Make small, start small, make it a part of your life. And then you really don't have to worry about it. You don't have to make your next new year resolution because it's going to be part of your life. So let's say if you are somebody who has never exercised for a while, you know, since the last five years, you're not taken up thing, start with something you enjoy, start with something which becomes part of your life. And then you can gradually build upon, right? So let's say, you know, uh, your wife is complaining that you're not spending too much time with her. Tell her, look, honey, let's go and take a walk for five minutes in the garden downstairs. And, you know, uh, for a few days, you will have to motivate her. But on the fourth and fifth day, she will actually motivate you. And then it becomes part of your life. And you will become those couple who walks every day in the garden in the evening time. You know, and, and you know, that's that's what who, who you are. It becomes part of your life. And that five minutes can then be built to 10 minutes. And then 10 minutes can build to 20 minutes. And 20 minutes can be built to 30 minutes as you go along, right? So my suggestion to you is buy a good pair of, you know, uh, uh, shoes. If you don't have a running shoes or a walking shoes, buy a good pair of that. Go today, go to the shop nearby it's Saturday evening, you know, uh, go and buy, or you can order it on your favorite online platform and just walk, right? Just, you know, like that Nike says, just do it, just do it, right? What you do, how much you do, doesn't matter. Just do it. And once you start doing it, you'll enjoy it. And it'll become a part of your life. And then, you know, we won't have this session trying to explain to you how much exercise you really need to do. Okay. So my answer to this, I leave it as an open-ended thing. If you're not exercising, just do it. That's the simple answer. That was, that was an amazing way to put across things that small changes can make a big difference. It's a matter of you starting them. Yeah. So as Dr. Ohm said, New Year is also uh, on the corner, not very far. This whole year has been taken away from our calendars by COVID, uh, but still we'll have 2021 coming soon. So rather than making very big resolutions, big promises to yourself and to the people around you, start with something small, get a nice pair of shoes and start walking. That will probably help you a little bit more. We'll definitely uh, come back uh, online with Dr. Hum Lakhani for another interesting session and uh, we would try and address type 1 diabetes. That's another issue which a lot of people have been asking us. But till then, friends, we would request you to stay safe, be indoors whenever possible, and make sure you wear a mask whenever you're out in public and maintain the physical distancing. So I would be signing off now. For those of you who have not been able to attend our today's session, please feel free to visit Zyrus Hospital's social media handles or you can as well visit Patient Support Services Africa's social media handles. So thank you very much for being patient listeners to us. Please share your feedbacks. They keep us motivated. Thank you, Jambo. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Om. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Be well. Happy weekend. Bye.